Hi, and welcome to this week's From the Vault episode from the Magdalene House podcast. The Magdalene House is a recovery community for alcoholic women, known affectionately by many as Maggie's. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Dallas, Texas. In our From the Vault episodes, we share past podcast releases from our four podcast series, Recover Ed, Studying the Steps, Recovered Interviews with Alcoholic Women, and Hope for the Family. Our podcast aims to connect, inspire, and educate alcoholic women, loved ones, and the community to the Magdalene House and the services we offer. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for listening. Hi, and welcome to Studying the Steps, where we take a deeper dive into the 12 steps. In each episode, An Alcoholic Woman in Recovery helps us study individual steps as outlined in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Through her personal experience and knowledge of working the program, she gives insight on how to apply and practice the spiritual principles being studied. This podcast is from the Magdalene House, a recovery community for alcoholic women. We are a nonprofit organization located in Dallas, Texas, and we provide comprehensive recovery services to alcoholic women at absolutely no cost. You can learn more and support our mission at magdalenehouse.org. Please note the curriculum we teach through our programs at Maggie's is from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. However, we are not an Alcoholics Anonymous group, and we are not associated with AA. Thanks for listening in. We're so glad you're here. All right. So good morning, everyone. We have Chloe with us this morning, who is going to be doing a workshop Mm -hmm. on steps eight and nine. So Chloe, thank you so much for joining us. We're all very happy to have you and take it away. Awesome. Well, I'm super glad to be here. Um, I'm an alcoholic. My name is Chloe. My sobriety date is July 7th, 1992. Um, I'm between home groups, but I believe super strongly in having a home group. So do as I say, not as I do. And I have a sponsor, my sponsor has a sponsor, and I am a sponsor. All things that I think are really important. So I'm talking about eight and nine, and just for, if anybody here is new to AA and the big book, and if you ever don't know what a step is, how it works has them all listed there. So I'll just kind of read what those two steps are on 59. Step eight is made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And then step nine is made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So we're talking about amends. And I will say like those steps were the scariest ones for me when I was first um, sitting in AA meetings. The idea of having to go back and you know, like I would just sit there and think, <laughs> think in meetings about all of the people that I would have to eventually face and confess things to. A lot of things that people didn't know that I had done, um, or I thought they didn't know, um, and so I was just in a lot of fear. Um, and I've since heard a couple of things that I really love. One of which, um, you know, is the idea that you're never going to have to make those amends ever. You won't ever have to do them. Um, you're going to be fine. You don't have to do it. And so obviously we go like, what are you talking about? (laughs) You know, Um, which the idea is when you get there, you will be a changed person. You, who you are right now, don't have power to do it. Um, you, You will never have to do them. By the time you get there, you will be ready. And that's been my experience. I think the biggest thing, um, the other thing that I've heard that I love um, and this was a, either a Joe or a Mark thing. They're, they're two guys who are both dead now, but they did a bunch of, there, there's Joe and Charlie and Joe and Mark. They're two different sets of guys that all did big book studies. And there's a bunch of their tapes out there and they're really great. But they would say, you know, um, you're like, you're going to have fear. It's terrifying making amends. I have been like, like, you know, scared to my very soul for every single amends that I've had to make. Um, And we pray and ask God to remove the fear. Um, And what in my, in my experience, it's never been removed. It's been alleviated just to the exact amount that I am actually able to walk through it. um, And no more than that. Um, But Joe would say, 
you will be, you will know exactly when you are willing to make these amends. This would be eight step, right? Like we're becoming willing. You will know because there's a very specific sound that you will hear when you are willing to make that amends. And then he knocks on the table. You know, the sound is me at the door, knocking on the door saying, you know, facing the person and making the amends. And that's, that's what willingness looks like. It's an action. Um, again, if I'm thinking that um, I can't make an amends until there is no fear there. I will never make the amends. It's always scary. Um, so that's just kind of the basics. Um, you know, we, we get our list for our eighth step list in our um, fourth and fifth steps. So that's where we begin it. So for me, you know, and everybody's sponsor does it a little bit differently. If you did it differently with your sponsor, um, she's right. I'm wrong. You know, do what she says. Don't do what I say. Um, you know, there's there's different ways to do it. But how I how I did it and how I do it with the people I sponsor is that when they're reading their fifth step, when they get to the end of each resentment, you know, I ask the question, "Did you cause harm there?" Um, and if there is yes, then we make a mark, you know, a plus up in the right hand corner. And then what she does is then she will revisit that later. Um, but that's where that basis for that um, eight step list is going to start is from that four step, you know, the, the harms that we cause. So this is about, and not, not everybody that we cause harm with, is it going to be appropriate to make amends for amends to them? Sometimes it is going to legitimately cause more harm. Um, that is, there's a lot of gray area there. And so, you know, one of the things that is so important in, in making amends is that you have a lot of sponsor direction there. Um, you know, and so like, I, I probably can't give you a lot of guidance about specific um, amends, go to your sponsor with it, because, you know, there's usually, um, you know, th there's usually a story there. So, you know, and, and again, different sponsors do it different ways. I've, you know, talked to people whose sponsors wouldn't let them make amends to past relationships. Um, and that's fine if that's what your sponsor does. Um, you know, I, most of my harms were in past relationships. And so I for sure had to sit down face to face with almost every ex-boyfriend, um, you know, and make amends for what I did. Um, but again, do what your sponsor tells you to do. One of my favorite amends with an ex-boyfriend um, was, I mean, and this was like a brief, you know, I don't know, a few, maybe a month long relationship, a very short one in high school where, you know, there was this kid and he ended up in AA too. So when I made amends to him, he was already in AA. And I had just ghosted him. Like I, we hooked up at a party, which is how every one of my relationships started was, you know, ending up in bed together and then trying to pretend that we were boyfriend and girlfriend after and having nothing in common. And then it was just so awkward. And I don't do conflict well, especially without a, you know, spiritual solution. So then I would just like, you know, stop answering phone calls and avoid the person, which is what I did with this kid. And so I made amends to him for like ghosting him and not being considerate and all of those things. We met at a coffee shop and um, like, I just, I felt like the worst person. I, you know, especially cause he was an AA and I knew that he was like really sort of like this sensitive, fragile guy. And, you know, I was sure that I had just like really affected his entire life um, and devastated him. He didn't remember any of it. You know, it was just so good. You know, he was like, oh, I mean, he remembered that like we had sort of dated or whatever, but he didn't remember me not answering his calls. Like I apparently didn't cause nearly as much heartbreak in that situation as I thought that I did. Making the amends was still, it was, it was good for me, right? Like it was still like it right sized me and, you know, we don't know. He might've, you know, had this whole story about being unworthy, you know, he didn't. So anyway, I have like, I have a lot of those just sort of like dumb little ones. Um, you know, I, I was a super thief and liar. So a lot of my amends were financial amends, having to go back to stores, um, having to pay back money, having to speak to managers and, you know, and I can talk about some of those. I'm sorry. My dog is making really, she, she does this every single zoom call I'm on just in the background, just rolling on the floor, growling. It's really awkward. Um, so let's, let's go into, um, into the book and we'll kind of look at some things in here on eight and nine. So if you start on 76, <clears throat> 
Um, okay, so middle of the page, Luna, stop. Now we need more action. So this is on the tail end of our seven step prayer. So one thing I love is that in the book, you know, it's like you'll sometimes hear an AA, the you know, do a step a year or whatever. Like in the book, it is so clear, like immediately, right away, at once. Yeah, you know, this is saying now we need more action. So right after we do that seven step prayer, we need more action. We can't, we cannot live in, in the last step we're on. It's always about forward motion here. Without which we find that faith without works is dead. Let's look at steps eight and nine. We have a list of all persons we have, we have harmed and to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. So there we go. That's, that's when we make this. We subjected ourselves to a drastic self-appraisal. Now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to repair. We're not just trying to say, like, wicked sorry, bro, you know, like, that was rough. I know, you know, but I'm a drunk, so, you know, you can't blame me. Like, I mean, I did that my whole life, right? Like, th but this is about going and repairing things. Um, and you know, the best description I've heard about it is, like, if we amend something, we fix it, we change it, you know, we, we are changing this situation. And obviously we can't undo what we've already done. But the example that I like is that, you know, if I was super mad at you and I broke your windshield, um, me going and saying like, hey, Crystal, super sorry about that windshield, you know, it's like, it was wrong of me. Like that's not an amends, that's an apology, right? Which, you know, apologies are sometimes the appropriate response. But in an amends, what I'm doing is I'm taking responsibility for it, but then I'm fixing your windshield. You know, it's like, and so that's what we're doing. We're, and you know, again, it's, it's not always as black and white as that. Sometimes it requires, um, you know, more prayerful consideration. Sometimes it requires some conversations with our sponsors. Um, but that, that's the point of this is to go and fix this stuff. Okay, back to the book. We attempt to sweep away the debris which has accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show our run the show ourselves, which is you know all I've done. I've just tried to you know make myself happy at everybody else's expense. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. So that's a prayer there. That's our little eight-step prayer. You know, if we haven't the will to do it, we ask until it's, it comes. God, please help me be willing here. Again, we don't wait until the fear is gone. Um, we just wait and, you know, we say the prayer and we do it anyway. Remember, and here's a big one. I love this. It was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. And sometimes I need to put myself back there. You know, it's when people aren't, sorry, I'm letting it up. When people aren't making amends, it's never because, it's never a ninth step issue. It's really not even an eighth step issue. If I'm not making amends, it's a first step issue. It's because I don't believe that I'm powerless and that this is going to kill me. I believe I have some power. I mean, same with six and seven, right? Like I've got these defects of character. I think that, it, you know, it's like my life doesn't depend on being done with them. I think that my life doesn't depend on me making this super embarrassing amends. Um, so when, when I am balking, you know, this is, this goes back to the first step. So you know, this is that our reminder there. Remember, we agreed at the beginning that we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol, and that's what this ninth step is about. You know, we, we cannot live free, um, you know, w without going and cleaning this up. And I will say, I've, and I've seen it with a lot of people, and I've probably been guilty of it myself, there is such a high that we get off of making amends. You know, you go, you walk out of there just, you know, like so, so full of God and so, um, you know, just, just on cloud nine. And I watch people space them out. They, you know, they, they live off of the excitement and the freedom of that amends until life gets rough again. And they make another one and it, you know, they drag them out and that's not what this is about. This is about making them, you know, not, not, um, not using them to just relieve enough of my misery to make it through. This is about having that complete psychic change. You know, so get the, these amends can be finished. This is doesn't have to be a lifelong process. Just get them done. They can just be done. Okay, so top of seventy-seven. There's a line there that says um, that we're talking about going to people um, and and emphasizing the spiritual feature on our first approach. 
there's what Bill is saying is, you know, it, it leading with that might prejudice people. But this line here I love, which is that our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. And that's just a spiritual principle in general. Yes, it's in the ninth step, but that fits everywhere. That's what my real purpose is, you know, and so we're, what we're given is these little hints into what I'm um, trying to achieve here. My purpose is to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and the people about me. So this whole chapter is full of a million different scenarios and different um, amends to make. The first one he's going to start with is making the approach to the man we hated. Um, so, you know, what he's talking about, it's harder to go to an enemy than to a friend, but we find it much more beneficial to us. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. Under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. And so the reason I point this one out is because we, we don't have to be totally free before we make this amends. You know, we don't have to get to the place where we're like, oh no, like, you know, she's such a child of God and I can just see all of her beauty and all of her like goodness. Like, no, we can still think that she sort of sucks. Um, you know, we, we do have to have already done our fourth and fifth step around it and be, you know, asking for those defects to be removed and all of those things. But the, as long, but th there are a lot of situations in which she, you know, that other person is more at fault. And I'll give you an example. And maybe I've shared this in here before. I know I've talked to you guys about the, um, the divorce that I just went through and, and it was rough, you know, like it was a really, um, it, you know, the past year and a half has kicked my butt with this. And, um, you know, the, the, my ex-husband, we were married for 25 years or something, you know, like I married him really young. We met in treatment and, you know, had babies together and, you know, moved across the country a couple of times. Like, you know, we, we had a long history and then he was unfaithful and, you know, and lied. And I didn't know for a long time. And, you know, it's a, big long story, but he was at fault, right? Like on paper, everything, if I told you the story, you'd be like, Chloe, you were the victim. He really sucked. And I'd say, you're right. You know, poor me, you know, it was really super rough. Um, and legitimately like, you know, as far as the checks and balances go, um, in that situation, he definitely created a lot more harm there. But as we talk about in four and five, as in war, the victor only seems to win. So what? So what? He's more at fault. I, it only looks like I win. At the end of the day, I am the one suffering from resentment and from, you know, being blocked from God. And so, like, you know, he, I was devastated on the tail end of this. And I was super mad and had a good story about why it wasn't fair. But at this point, like, you know, and what... I, I know what it feels like to be connected to God. I know what it feels like to be free. I know what it feels like to live in the sunlight of the spirit. And as soon as I am resentful, I am blocked from that. And I was doing my best to, you know, reconnect to God and to get back into that, to get that current, you know, flowing again. Um, and I had to write a lot of inventory over and over again, sometimes about the exact same thing over and over again. Um, but what I knew is I had a couple of ways that I hadn't shown up very well in the um, aftermath of this. You know, I made some super snarky comments that I didn't need to make. Um, his birthday and Father's Day came about a month after I found out about the infidelity. And, you know, I didn't show up well for his birthday. I didn't show up well for Father's Day. I didn't encourage, you know, I didn't do what I could to have the kids show up well for either of those events. Um, you know, and I felt justified about it at the time. Um, but living according to God's will and living as a sober, recovered um, woman of integrity, like that's not okay with me. Um, it felt, it felt pretty good in the moment, but those are the things that lead to me being blocked from God. And so if I want to be free, if I want to be connected, if I want to have this, you know, different way of life, then what I had to do was sit down and make amends to him. He hadn't made amends to me. Um, I knew he felt, you know, I knew that he knew that he hadn't done the right thing, but it, it wasn't about that. I, like, if I'm going to wait for him to apologize first, like, I'm, I'm not going to be free. And if I believe that my life depends on having this clear and open, con um, you know, channel of communication with God, 
then it is my responsibility to make sure that if anything is blocking me from that contact, that I get rid of it. And so that resentment and my um, need to make an amends there, um, that, that was my number one priority was getting reconnected to God. So sitting down with him, I think it was maybe three or four weeks, two or uh, somewhere in there, a, a few weeks after finding out about everything that had happened, you know, and I'm not saying it to like, you know, get a pat on the back or like, wasn't I great? Like it was, I wasn't trying to be a good person. I wasn't trying to like get accolades. I was dying inside. Um, you know, my, I was so full of fear. Um, I was doubting whether God existed. I was doubting whether God loved me. I was doubting whether, um, you know, there was a God that was personal to me. I couldn't feel anything. Um, you know, I couldn't feel a connection there. So I, I was, my friend Jeff says, it's not so much that I am running towards the light as much as I am running from the flames. And so I wasn't going to him to make this amends because, you know, as most of my life is because I know it's the right thing to do. It was far more because the pain of being stuck where I was, was enough to drive me towards doing the right thing. Um, so that's a pretty recent amends. Um, you know, there's been a million apologies here and there too, but that, you know, the format that I sort of use for amends is, um, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but because I mean, and again, different people do it different ways, but, um, but I, I have I, a question. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Um, so in that paragraph, it says, um, that we confess our former ill feeling and I've heard two things around this, um, that if somebody doesn't know that we've had ill feeling towards them, then we don't say it. But then I've recently heard that you do say it if they don't know. Do you have any insight on that? Well, I, I would say, like, I'm not going to go and make amends to somebody for having an ill feeling against them. I will say if I did something and I caused harm, then I think that it's probably usually appropriate to say that I had ill feeling. You know, um, so like, again, I wouldn't be like, hey, I used to think you were a bitch, but now I see you're really a great person. You know, it's like, um, or I had to pray a lot, but now like God's helped me see that you don't suck as much as I thought you did. Like that, I don't think would be helpful or, you know, kind and loving. But I think that if I did something, um, you know, that caused you harm, you're going to know that I had ill feeling towards you, you know? And so what it does is for me, like, you know, again, you know, just to pull on my recent experience, you know, one of the, like, and I, I you know, I think especially as women, we're really intuitive. We are, we, and we rely on that intuition. And I think one of the ways that I was most harmed by that infidelity was three years of sec second guessing my intuition. Right. And so that was something that uh, and he, and he has since made amends for that, you know, that, but, um, so I think when, when we can say like, you know, I had ill feeling, I mean, that's not the language I would use, but you know, it's like, I, I've been judging you or I've, you know, been harboring this resentment against you. What it does is it validates for the other person, you know, what they already knew, you know, and I think that's important because I think we take that from people when, when we're not honest. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. What is your insight on making amends with things that either can't be fixed or can't be fixed immediately? What do you mean? Can you give, can you be a little um, more specific? Yeah. So like with your story, you know, I, I'm thinking about your husband making amends. And so as he was the one who was unfaithful, obviously, you know, that may or may not make your marriage work um, just because he made amends. But what does that amends look like? Um, you know, it, like with your windshield example, you can't go and fix the windshield in something like that. You know what I mean? Um, so is there, do you have any examples on or any insight into what amends can look like in a situation where it's not so black and white, where it does, isn't so such a quick, easy fix? Like, right. That. Absolutely. So the amends he made to me was really just taking responsibility for what he did and, and in that way, fixing it. So, you know, it, it, it wasn't like he could say, I mean, like a, a lot of what, honestly, like in action, tangible, what he did to fix it was to not fight me in the divorce. You know, he showed up, um, you know, very like 
first of all, generous, but also just, you know, really humble and, um, you know, and compassionate through what could have been a really contentious divorce. So he made that easy. That, that was like an amends in action. His verbal amends to me was, you know, outlining the ways that, and he didn't go into all the dirty details and I, you know, didn't ask for them, but um, I knew enough, you know, but he, and I probably, if I had asked, he maybe would have told me, but you know, what he did was acknowledge the the dishonesty and making me second guess my um, intuition. He acknowledged, you know, how it harmed our children. You know, he had moved me to Dallas and that, you know, and so he just really took ownership for the ways that he saw that harm was caused. And I will, so to, to pull on, you know, how I actually make amends and he did the same thing. I do say, you know, I, I start usually, depend, depending on the situation, I'll say, you know, I'm an a, you know, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is what I, um, you know, this, this is part of what I need to do for my recovery. And then I'll, you know, talk about what the harms were, right? Um, if the person already knows, then you don't have to go through all that. But what I find, what I, what I like about doing that is that it has, and it has worked this way, if somebody has um a need for aa they now know somebody that they can go to right they now have you know a, a face to put to that but um I, so i i outline the harms i don't go into like justification i make sure that i don't try to manipulate m through language them feeling sorry for me um you know that i've had people make amends to me where like in, and i've maybe even made amends where i like you know give too much of a story about why like it's not really my fault you would have done it too don't do that <laughs> you know like this is really just black and white like here are the harms um here are the harms that i see then i'll say like is there anything that i left out and i have had people for sure say yep you did this and you did that and you did this um, and then I will say, you know, are you willing to share with me how this affected you? Um, and then it becomes a conversation if, if they're willing to go there with, you know, what, what that did to them, how that, um, you know, took something from them or caused harm, you know, in a way that I didn't, wasn't aware of. And then I will usually say what, what my intention is to make this right, how, you know, how I see that I can fix it, but I will ask them if there's anything else I can do to fix it. I've had people say, yes, like, I need you to go and tell this other person, you know, what you just told me because they've been blaming me for this thing this whole time or what, you know, there's sometimes things like that. Like we don't ever really know um, going into it. I mean, I was a blackout drinker. So a lot of, a lot of things, like I only remembered a very small portion of the story, you know, um, or, you know, it's like, you know, harms that were over a great number of years, like with my sister, um, you know, she, she, she was harmed in ways that I didn't know she was harmed. You know, like I, I took my mother's love from her. You know, my sister was getting great grades. She was a good kid. She was where she was supposed to be. And I robbed that positive attention from her because everybody was so focused on, you know, um, the dumpster fire that was me, you know. Um, so that was something that I hadn't gone into the amends knowing, um, that I needed to make amends for. So it really becomes more of a conversation. I do usually have people write a letter first um, before they, you know, they, I have people do index cards and they write out, you know, who it is, how to get in touch with them and what the harms are. And then I ask them to write a letter. I don't have them read the letter to the person or mail the letter, but I have them reread it before they go in. And I, for me, like I, I tend to do best with writing anyway. So it's just a way of organizing it and making sure that, um, like, I've, I've just found it helpful as far as being able to kind of put to words what can feel overwhelming and terrifying. Um, and so the first, the person often feels more prepared going in. And again, it's, it's really just a conversation. Um, you know, and I've seen amazing things happen. Most of mine, again, have been financial, have been, you know, people that don't really know me. Um, I have one example of a financial one that I, that I tell quite a bit. It was this little store back where I lived in Maine and I used to steal from them all the time. So much stuff over years and years. And when I moved back to Maine, they were on my amends list and I was just dragging my feet about it. You know, it's like I, it was a small town. I knew like, you know, I knew the daughter of the owner. So I sort of knew who the owner was. And I remember going in there one day sober and shopping and one of the, 
um, employees just followed me around the whole time. And they were known for that. They were suspicious, but I took it so personally. And I realized I took it personally because I hadn't cleaned up this amends yet. So uh, like I, I knew, you know, roughly what I owed. I knew what the harms were as far as I could tell. So I made an appointment to go and sit down with the owner. Um, and I showed up and, you know, or I called her and she said, you know, well, I, I just have this short window. I need, you know, like I can do right now. And so I couldn't get my sponsor on the phone. We had talked already, you know, in a general way, but I raced over there and they had this big sign in the front window, this going out of business sale. And I didn't know that they were closing. We sat down and, you know, I, I outlined the harms. I outlined how much I, how much money I owed. I was super broke at the time. And so what I could afford to do was pay $25 every pay period. So every, every two weeks I could send her a check for $25. Um, and she accepted that. She said that, you know, that, that was fine with her. Um, and I, when I asked her if she was willing to share with me how this affected her, what she said was that she was going out of business because of shoplifters. And not only had um, shoplifting affected her business financially, but it also had taken her heart out of it. She felt unappreciated and disrespected and, you know, uh, by the very community that she was part of and that she served um, and that it had, you know, taken her love out of, um, out of the business. And so like, I felt that I wouldn't have ever known if I hadn't asked her that question. Um, and I got to see really clearly how my selfish actions had a direct impact on another person and her livelihood. Um, you know, and I think that like, th that's important for me. It's important for me to like, it, like we don't live in a fishbowl, you know, it's like our actions affect a lot more people than often we know. Um, and so like, you know, that, that was a, that was a powerful one for me. And in every paycheck, I sent her a $25 check and, um, when I had finally paid it all off, I sent a, a note with that last one and she sent a really sweet card back and, and what, and I knew we were clean. I knew we were, you know, um, there was no hard feelings there. And I had the strong sensation that if she ever needed to call somebody in AA, she would feel like she could call me. Um, and then several years later, she opened another store of the same name, one town over. And I go in there even today when I go back to Maine to visit and those women always follow me around like I'm a shoplifter and it doesn't bother me anymore. I just know that they're doing their job. I don't take it personally. I don't feel self-righteous. Um, I just know that, you know, it has nothing to do with me. Um, yeah, I Michelle. I have a question. Um, so um, what do you, so I have a daughter that's 28 and I've been in and out of AA since early 2000. So she was born in 92. So I've drank alcoholically and used all of her life. My grandkids is full. I've used all of my grandkids life. And uh, um, I was always using or, you know, something um, and drinking around them. So I have, uh, she's real, she didn't talk to me for almost 60 days, um, but she's a huge part of my life, like really close with both my daughters. And um, so, she doesn't really want to hear you know the amends so it's more of a living amends and what are your thoughts or surrounded around that do you have any experience with that what do you think about that i feel of course i'm making it about me that i should you know listening to you even more so take responsibility for um that action that i the wrongs i did um, but I don't, you know, obviously can't push anything on her. And um, my sponsor said, you know, Michelle, it needs to be a living amends. And um, anyways, I just was wondering what your thoughts were around that. Well, do you know for sure that she doesn't want to hear it or are you assuming that? Yeah, she's kind of told me, um, but I don't think, I think she thinks it's going to be more of an apology. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, it is kind of, I guess, but I just want to, you know, um, sit across from her and take ownership and say, I know I did these things, you know, um, but I don't know. I, you know, once again, maybe I need to have a little bit more conversation with her and my sponsor. I don't know, but that's, but um, I've, you know, she knows, and I said, well, I'll, she knows that I'm trying to make in the living amends to her. You know what I mean? Um, 
and I don't want to push her on anything, but I don't know that I've approached, I don't know if I'm approaching it in the right way, if that makes any sense. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, I guess, um, man, it hit me hard when I started to talk to you about it. I didn't realize that it bothered me as bad as it does. Uh, but, you know, she's even said, mom, mom was never been sober around my kids and I haven't. And they're almost four and um, seven. And now, you know, and I was high at the hospital when my grandson was born. You know, it's just, uh, and, my, and my, my granddaughter, both of them, um, since, I've, since I've been sober for these last five months, you know, she's letting me watch them again, which is it's like my husband and I both, which is just awesome, you know. Um, so I have been sober around them for the last five months, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just, I just wanted to know how much I love her and, and want to do the right thing. So I just didn't know what your thoughts were around all that. Sorry. You don't have to apologize. That's, you know, that's happy stuff. <laughs> I, and I would say like, follow your sponsor's direction on it because again, those relationships are so complicated and I'm sure there's a lot of backstory there that I don't have. So for sure, do what she guides you to. Um, but I will say like, I think li living amends are the, are the most important piece because, you know, like if, if I'm just, you know, making amends and, you know, even if I do a solid amends, if I just keep doing the same behavior, um, it doesn't, it, like, it, it just negates all of it. Like this is about us being changed, right? And this is about us showing up differently day in, day out and being th that person, you know, that your daughter and your grandkids, you know, um, deserve. And that's going to, you know, speak volumes. Um, you know, and, but I will say like making that direct amends is a really important piece. Um, and it may be that your sponsor wants you to just have more of the more time, um, you know, wh where your daughter gets to see the consistency of your, um, you know, of your sobriety and the way that you're showing up differently. I mean, again, that's where like that sponsor direction is so important, but, um, because especially like if, if you have a history of relapsing a lot, she may want you to, you know, just get some time in before doing that. I do. And she's heard it so many times. Okay. Like, I'm so sorry. You know, of course yeah. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I probably handled the amends in a totally wrong way. But, I would say know, it does say two times in there. We're allowed to say we're sorry. We, it's not, we that's kind of a misconception in AA that it's not, a. I mean, it's not about, you know, just saying we're sorry, but it's, there, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with using that word. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. This is such a great discussion, such a great discussion. And Michelle, I'm glad that you opened that floor to, cause you and I are obviously in very similar situations with our children, but and maybe I'm misunderstanding and this is going to be great for me to go back to my sponsor. Um, because my sponsor has said, um, this is not about a living amends. This is not about us becoming a, a martyr for this program, I guess, that this is about doing the next right thing, but this is not about not being able to face your creator, not being able to feel the sunlight not being able to be of maximum service. I want you to do the next right thing, but this isn't about, well, I just sucked this up so much. So I have to live in, in the shame and, you know, this living amends because then you can't be happy, joyous and free. And that's not how we could be most, helpful to others so am i i think i may like i i it's michelle it's confusing like i i understand and for sure <laughs> so is there a chloe is there is the living amends wrong 
or have I misunderstood or maybe I need to go back. And then what I have done now with my daughter, because I'm like you, Michelle, I've, I've been drunk half her life. Um, I, I, I can't say I'm never going to do this again. I can't say when she writes out her stuff to me, Chloe, then I take that back to Marguerite and say, Marguerite, what do I say now? I mean, this is just so, it's harder than it looks. Well, it's some of, and that's, that's why sponsor direction is so important, but living amends, I mean, it, do, it doesn't ever use that word in the big book. It's just semantics. And when I hear living amends, what, what I interpret that is as right action. It is doing the next right thing. That's, that's all living amends is. It doesn't mean that like now I forever need to like beg for your forgiveness. All it means is me showing up as a recovered woman. That's it. Okay. Um, so it doesn't mean that I'm always in that place of like humbling myself before you hoping that you're going to forgive me. This is me just showing up how I should have been showing up. And that's already. what I really like this discussion is when you gave the example of the lady that you shoplifted from, then you said, hey, we were clean. Hey, when I walked down the street or in her store and somebody followed me, I can't hold my head up high. It's not about me anymore. Right. So that, that helps. Okay. Can I say something real quick on this topic? Um, because it's my son, it's been four years since he's spoken to me. And um, I've been through this game with my, not game, but deal. And I have, my sponsor did allow me to write a couple of letters to him finally. And got, I got no response. Um, so I have been through this heartbreak. And one thing she told me that finally settled me down, she goes, Gina, like you were saying, it's not about me. God is, and I have to realize this, God is working on him and God is working on me. And if I will stay out of the way when the right time comes, when he is healed over all the hurts that I gave him and, and I am in a, in wherever God wants me to be at that point, who knows, we might meet on the street, but I have to stay out of it because I kept trying to make it work. And then when I didn't, it didn't work on my timing, I drank. I kept trying to make it work and I kept thinking, well, I've been sober this long now. I'm a house manager now. Surely he sees that. That's not what it's about. I have to let him heal on his own time. I have to let me heal and let God put us together in his timing. Easier said than done. But that's what really gave me more strength to just move on because I can't make amends to him either. He, he, does, he doesn't want any part of it. But I can't be resentful over that. That's, that's his issue i don't know how he's feeling and i have to give that to god yeah we we get so or at least i get so selfish about amends like i i want i want to i want closure i want to cross this one off the list i want the great story i want to be able to tell you about how like you know this relationship has been repaired um you know it like i i, I want things neat and tidy and we, we don't always get that because, you know, we our lives have been so messy and, you know, other people get to say if they're ready to hear it or not. The really, the only really important thing here is that true willingness to make the amends. As if we are will, if we are absolutely willing, like if that person was there, we would sit, we would, you know, bear our whole entire, you know, heart to them on the, with this amends, then we will get the same relief that we will if we actually made it you know that that's it because some people we can't find um you know if somebody's dead we can you know read a letter um and you know people get you know have, have great stories around that um but th this is about the willingness to do it the true willingness because you're right some people won't see us we've caused too much harm and um you know we don't get to we don't get to now selfishly inflict our amends on them just because we want you know, we want that, that relief. Any other questions? How are we doing for time? Okay, we only have a few more minutes. I do want to talk, this is one thing that, uh, so it, well, just to kind of 
freeze through some of this stuff. It's going to, the, the chapter goes through owing money. So there's like financial amends stuff in here. One thing I want to touch on with that is um, you will be amazed if you go to make financial amends. And if the thing you're thinking is like that you're giving your money to this person, um, most likely people aren't going to take it. Um, if you can be reminded that you, this isn't your money, this is their money, you're just giving it back way more people are, um, eight, uh, will take it then. Like that's the, the amends is like, you're not giving your money. That's their money that you've been, you know, withholding from them. So it is my responsibility to give it back to them. Again, different people do it different ways, but, um, what I tell my sponsees to do and what my sponsor had told me to do, um, was if they aren't willing to take it, um, what I'm to ask is if they have a charity that they would like it donated in their name. Um, again, it, I, I need to know that I'm not walking out of there with that money still in my pocket. You know, it, it does not belong to me. So it's either going to them or it's going to a charity. Um, or sometimes there's another place for it to go. Yeah, Steph. Um, I just want to share something about that. So I, my uncle um, would give me money a lot to bail me out um because i was a i played up the single mom card a lot and i needed to pay my rent and all of these things when really i was spending my money on drugs and alcohol and um and then i would go to his wife and i would manipulate her out of money and so both of them were giving me money and they didn't they didn't know it um and so whenever i went back to make this amends to them and all i had was a hundred dollars with me to to start it um, they were very adamant about not taking it. Right. And, um, and they were like, save it for cadence. And I, I like left with like, okay, I'm going to save it for cadence. Like I'm doing the right thing. And, um, and God like kept putting it on my heart. So I just started Venmoing them money each, each time I got paid and they never returned it, <laughs> you know? And so they accepted it. And so that's always just like something that, um, I don't know, that always like like still speaks up to me whenever we talk about financial amends. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah. People, gen it, it, uh, people feel awkward about it, you know, but yeah. And then that way, if they don't want it, they can donate it on or whatever, you know, but um, yeah, it's not our money. So, uh, you know, the, the book goes through some of that stuff. It talks about if we've committed crimes, um, one of the things that I love is on 79 talking about, you know, um, and again, sponsor direction, always, always, I can't, um, I can't, you know, say that enough, but that first full paragraph there, um, although, so it's, again, it's talking about we've committed a criminal offense. Although these reparations take innumerable forms, there are some general principles which we find guiding. Reminding ourselves, so that here we're being reminded here again, that we decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience, we ask that we be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences may be. So there's a prayer there. We may lose our position or reputation or face jail, but we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. And so, you know, that's being pretty clear with us there that like, you know, um, that, that we, we don't get to skate out of it just because we may get in trouble. I mean, again, always go to your sponsor about that. It will talk about how like, you know, if we have, you know, a family that may impact more than just us. And so we have to consider those things. But, you know, this, it says it twice. We have decided to go to any lengths to find a spiritual experience and, you know, this is where the, you know, rubber meets the road, man. Like, what, what does any lengths mean? You know, what does it mean to you? And, you know, it's like, I'm, well, any lengths except for that, you know. Um, I have never heard of somebody having to go to jail after making an amends um, for criminal behavior. I just haven't. I'm sure that somebody's got a story of it happening, but um, I've never heard of it happening. Um, all right, so then it's going to go on to amends that um, may implicate other people. He's really clear that we, we don't get to do that. We have to ask their permission. And then it's going to go through the spouse, and that's usually a big one, you know, especially if we've been with the same person through our drinking. They're usually the ones that we've harmed the most. Um, and, you know, talks about infidelity. 
Um, at the bottom of 82, I love this paragraph. The alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. We feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came up out of the, his cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand the wind stopped blowing. Um, and so I think, you know, it's like I for sure would try to hide behind that. Well, I'm a lot better than I used to be. At least I'm not, you know, but it doesn't always feel like that to the people that are around when we're still showing up, you know, living by self-will, stepping on toes and you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, again, like, like Gina with her son, I mean, sometimes it takes years to clean things up and just to, um, you know, really show people that we're changed. It's about those day to day little tiny things where we, you know, are showing with consistency that we've, that we've, um, you know, changed. You know, and there, there's, I mean, there's just so much good stuff in here and I'm going to run out of time, but I do want to quickly, um, if you guys can, Turn back to 52 for a quick sec. <clears throat> and I just want to kind of, I, I like paralleling these two. So this is, you know, this is in We Agnostics. And this is, you know, us talking about, people call these the bedevilments. And this is what, this is what my, when we talk about restless, irritable, discontented, right? Um, th that's what this paragraph is talking about. And so this, this is what I look like you know, before having had a spiritual experience, before that whole, um, you know, that the, before that whole psychic change has happened. So I'm going to read through it. Um, this first sentence doesn't make sense out of context, but I'm reading it anyway. We had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems this same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. And so, and sometimes I'm like that sober. Often I'm like that sober. This is always a good barometer for me to go back to that paragraph. This is me unrecovered. Okay. Um, again, it's, it still sometimes happens. So I want you to, you know, kind of keep those things, um, in the back of your mind when we read this other um, paragraph on the bottom of 83. So these are the ninth step promises that if you've gone to AA a minute, you've heard them right at the beginning of meetings. So if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. So that's halfway through this ninth step, halfway through our events. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. <clears throat> and so if you, and, and I do it a lot of times in my 10 a.m. meeting at Maggie's, those two, they are parallel opposites. And what I talk about is how, like, I, this, these promises in the ninth step, that's who I wanted to be. That's the life I wanted. I wanted peace. I wanted serenity. I wanted to be of real help to other people. Um, I didn't want to be controlled by my emotions. I didn't want to be run by fear. Like, you know, I, I wanted, um, you know, my whole attitude and outlook on life to change. You know, that was really attractive to me. I could not will these things. I could not force that. I, I tried my whole life, um, my sobriety to be this person. I could not be this person. All I could do is the 12 steps. All I could do was finish my amends. And th these, when they say promises, it's not saying that we are creating this. These are what are what happen for us. It says, are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us. 
sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. We work for them by doing these steps. That's it. Finish your amends and th these will happen for you. Um, you know, and, and that's the best thing I can offer to you. And then we, you know, you'll learn in step 10, um, you know, which happens right after you start these amends, you know, you'll be brought to a place where you'll react samely and normally around alcohol and you can't drink even if you, even if it crosses your mind, you know, it's like, what a beautiful promise that is. Like we get a whole new world here, a whole new life. And all we have to do is the next right thing. All we have to do is do these steps. Yeah. Any last second uh, questions before we wrap up? Thank you very much for coming on. Absolutely. I'm sure I forgot a million things that I wanted to talk about, but. It was good. It was great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Chloe. Bye, guys. Have a great Bye. day. It was so good. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it. This has been a re-release from the Magdalene House podcast for our From the Vault series. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Tune in every Wednesday for a new release from one of our four series. To learn more about the Magdalene House and the services we offer, visit magdalenehouse.org or follow us on your favorite social media channels.